and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And we are so pleased that tonight we are welcoming Emily Edwards, author and host of Fuck Boys of Literature, to talk about her new novel, Viviana Valentine Gets Her Man. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This is when I get sheepish because I have to talk about my own thing. And I'm just kind of like, oh, this is so much fun. It's definitely different being on the other side of the interview. So weird. (laughs) Well, I should warn you that we are very hardcore journalists and you're going to have a lot of like difficult questions to answer. Cool. Such as, what's something great that happened lately? (laughs) (laughs) I had a boatload of doctor's appointments last week, which is like a womp, 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 sad trombone. But like, I got a very good report on a clear bill of health and I'm very, very excited. And I I, I don't want to go into like nitty gritty (laughs) details, but it was good. It was good. Good health reports are some things that we can really kind of get behind. A clean bill of health. Great news. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yes, definitely good. How about you? My good thing is that I didn't actually think of a good thing. So I'm completely (laughs) unprepared for this question, as per usual. Sarah, we only do this every week. (laughs) I know, I know. And like, this is, this is honestly, I think we've said this before on the podcast, but this is honestly the hardest question of the podcast to answer. <laughs> seriously, seriously, this is no joke, especially when you spend so much time on Twitter being all doom and gloom and cranky like <laughs> yeah. I do. And then it's just like, wait, I have to pretend the sun rose this morning. I don't think so. <laughs> I have to think about something good. I think my good thing is that my pugs are very cozy because it's getting colder. And so like, they're always cuddly, but when it's warm, they overheat and they start panting. And I'm like, don't cuddle with me. You're giving yourself health <laughs> issues. <laughs> but when it's cold, I can enjoy their snuggliness. That is wonderful. My good thing starts with a question. Is it still nepotism if you're not related and they're actually very good at what they do? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was going to make a joke about bullying my boss into hiring her, but that's unfair to my friend who I recently hired and she's been there for a couple of weeks. She's doing great. It's so much fun to hang out in the office all day and have someone to help. I work in a very small office, so we've just quadrupled our employees by hiring someone. <laughs> See, that's not nepotism. That's connections. There you go. I like that. networking. Yeah, I like that much better. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But that's that's my good thing. Not that uh, we hired her, but that it's been going great and we don't hate each other yet. So that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and what is everyone drinking on this fine evening? I'm the sad sack with just water. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You'll be very hydrated and we will Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have water, but I also do have a small glass of whiskey in honor of our favorite hard-boiled detective, Viviana Valentine. Excellent choice. I went festive this evening and I'm drinking Elysian's Punkachino, which is a coffee pumpkin ale. Ooh. And it really just tastes like a pumpkin spice latte, but in beer form. <laughs> that sounds really good, though. It's quite nice. <laughs> and this is actually a book podcast. Surprise. <laughs> I know we faked you out with the first couple questions. Has anyone read anything good lately, other than, of course, the book that we will be discussing tonight in depth? I haven't. I've been reading Viviana Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else, just Nothing that. else. <laughs> I read a short story collection of Dashiell Hammett's Continental Op short stories. He's a really lesser known, I guess, detective fiction. You know, he's way more famous for Nick and Nora and, and uh, the guy from Maltese, Sam Spade, but the Continental Op is a hoot and a half. They were all published in like the early 1900s during prohibition. And so like, they're all like prohibition swashbuckling stories and granted chock full of 1920s racism. So heads up for that, but like (laughs) surprisingly good short stories. And I find PI short stories to be very hard to do. And they were all really, really good. That's awesome. Sarah, are you going to save us or are we just both being lame this evening? (laughs) I started reading The Silmarillion, rereading The Silmarillion because I got so angry about Rings of Power that I was like, I'm going to go read read The Silmarillion. Me too. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, like fair play to anyone who enjoyed it. I don't want to take away from that, but it was, um, I I was not, mm, yeah. 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 We've said this before, but, and then people complain about the wrong thing. And then I'm defending <laughs> this show because I'm like, no, the problem is not that they cast a black elf, you doofus. <laughs> the problem is that it's so bad. <laughs> Those are different. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> how dare you make me defend this awful show? But that's not what we're here to talk about. No. <laughs> that's a different episode. <laughs> that's the B-roll. That's, that's a whole other episode. <laughs> so you recently wrote a book that came out yesterday, I say, from the future. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Viviana Valentine got her man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, should I tell you where I got Viviana Valentine from? Please we do. Not, we didn't have the guts to ask that question. So thank okay. you for offering to. <laughs> so I legitimately, for the longest time, like way too many decades, have had this joke that my alternate ego is this old woman named Viv, who's like one of those old ladies who can like drink a cocktail and have a cigarette in the same hand. <laughs> and she like wears too much leopard print and she's just like really brash. And she knows she's got Smoka's voice and stuff like that. And so I was like, I have to name my character some, you know, combination of, of where you're going to get Viv from. And then I accidentally named it after a porn star so I had to change it to Viviana Valentine instead of Vivian Valentine and there's still a little porn elements to it that I did not think through but that's okay I love the name so much I feel like it just it gives more character and that backstory gives more character to to it she was great already but now she's even better yeah so imagine her like 50 years in the future and she's just gonna be like this old woman in like stretch pants and ballet flats and she's always drinking gin and it's just yeah it's just like well in her younger years she was this (laughs) i love that you started with her retirement i had no idea (laughs) she's so vivacious and young on the page (laughs) i didn't know what she had in store i didn't have much of a 20s like a lot of people my age you know it was just kind of like you graduated into the 08 recession and then it was just kind of like work 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 and like try not to suffocate and so like i kind of just like wanted to write this really cool broad who was just like (laughs) working because she had to but she was like making the most of it and stuff like that so that's that's Viv. <laughs> I love her attitude towards work and the way that sometimes she's like, yeah, my boss isn't here. I don't have anything to do right now. I'm just going to fuck off and go home. <laughs> <laughs> There's one scene where she like takes off her girdle because it's hot out. And I was just like, do you have any idea how many times and like when I lived in Los Angeles, I'd just be like, off comes the bra. I'm like, it's just, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm alone in the office, I'm not going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> Oh, and now we work from home and we don't even have to put on a bra. <laughs> exactly. It's great. Oh, the future is now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not when Viviana lives. She lives in the 50s. She does. It is straight up 1950 when she is taking place. And oh, there's a lot of complicated feelings about that time period. <laughs> So were you into the 50s before writing this book? No, not at all, actually. Like, I I am fascinated with the post-war years very much so and, like, gender dynamics of that. Like, I've been tossing around ideas for, like, screenplays and stuff like that with my friends of, like, that very specific time period where it's, like, you know everybody thinks about the fifties as like the promise years. And then I'm just like, Oh wait, no, guess what? It was filled with squalor and terror <laughs> and the lo- nothing was like set in stone yet. And it's just like America's like, hoorah, all this potential. And it turns out like nothing had gotten sorted yet. Like it was still just like completely up in the air after world war two. And I'm like, this is great. This is super <laughs> fertile, like areas to like poke around in and mess with. And it's just really fun. Also horrifying. (laughs) So if you weren't originally into the 50s, how much research did you have to do? Because like you include a lot of what to me sounds like very authentic, like slang and description of dresses and cocktails and things like that. I will say that like the 
fashion and the food came really, really easy because like when I was a kid, I really wanted to be a fashion writer. Like that was like, I am going to work for Vogue. This is like the most amazing thing I want to do. And then the print industry went completely belly up and I had no (laughs) avenue for getting a job. So I was just kind of like, what do I do with all of this useless information that I have ping ponging around in my head? And it's mostly annoy people and then (laughs) write really good historical fiction about garments. And then the cocktails thing is my main profession from my working career was I was a wine and spirits writer. So like that was just like easy golden age of cocktails. But the, (laughs) um, the other stuff is a terrifying jaunt into the internet in order to find out like how politics worked and what neighborhood was Robert Moses knocking down in New York city like this week and things like that. So it's mostly on the fly research because like, yay, internet, but it does get you a lot. Like J store is free now, everybody. It's great. I used to have to go into my college's library internet and log on from like the computer in the library in order to get access to J store. And now you can just like have it and it's wonderful and it opens up all these avenues of interesting things that you never knew about <laughs> that are vetted yes exactly. <laughs> <And it's real. laughs> because there's a lot of interesting things out there but I wouldn't say they're all equal excellent point <laughs> do you do you find that that process has gotten a little easier for you as because I know that even though Viviana Valentine is the first book that's published, I know that you have written book two and you're working on book three. Yeah. Like, do you find that because you've written multiple books, like you have more of a store of knowledge in your head or are you still looking up stuff? Yeah, no, that's definitely the case is that like, I know for a lot of like the laws about what people are, are not allowed to do, you know, that's kind of like gotten embedded in my head, like fashion wise and and gender presentation wise and, you know, things like that. That's definitely been more embedded in my head. And then also for Fuckboys of Lit, I was doing a lot of like term paper kind of episodes for a while where I was writing more like deep dives into literature and stuff like that. And I hadn't really used my research muscles since college. And so like, they've definitely been exercised a lot more over the last like two years of of doing stuff like this, because I really want to get it right. I do not want people like adding me on Twitter and yelling me that like, you know, even down to the stupidest things of like this shade of lipstick wasn't invented until 1965. (laughs) So I'm out here going like, what was Maybelline's entire catalog in 1950? (laughs) You don't want to get one that didn't come out until 51, you know, because people are like that. And I would prefer to keep that to a minimum. (laughs) That's, that's very valid. (laughs) So you already had all the fashion in your head. Were there any like particular inspirations? Cause there are some incredible outfits described in this book. There is one outfit that one of the main characters is an heiress. Her name is Tallulah Blackstone. She shows up on this yacht party. I described the dress that she is wearing and it is an actual Christian Dior dress that he drew, created a couture dress in 1950. And I've posted photos of it to like Twitter and stuff like that, but I'll post it up again because it is the most stunning dress I've ever seen in my life. It is like a cascade of pleated blue or white silk fans down the front of the dress. And it's just, I can't even describe it in words. It's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And I was like, that one, like the (laughs) fanciest girl in the book gets to wear that one. And then there's a dress that Viv borrows. That's a a red Claire McArdle dress. I chose Claire McArdle for a reason because she was actually kind of the inventor of American sportswear. So even though she did fancy evening gowns and stuff like that too, because you had to back in that day because evening wear was a thing unlike now where we go everywhere and like sweatpants it's which I'm not deriding but like I really wanted her to wear a dress that was more known for, from a designer that was more known for like casual wear and actually like stay at home woman work wear she invented this dress called a popover dress and it was basically the precursor to Donna Karen's wrap dress which like everybody has one at some point I don't have any boobs so I can't actually wear them they just like open up and it's not good but like it was this original like sort of like heavy denim wrap dress that you would put over your cocktail dress while you were cleaning the house and then like when someone came over or knocked on the door you could like pull off this dirty disgusting dress and still like be looking cute underneath it which was like a thing in the 50s you had to do 
screw the fifties. And so she made a bajillion dollars off of this wrap dress while also Mm -hmm. making like really cool, beautiful evening gowns out of like silk with gorgeous embroidery and things like that. And I was like, this is so neat. I have to put this in the book. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there is that interesting dynamic between, oh, it is really fun to dress up. I do wish I had a reason to ever with oh, no, if you come to my front door, you get what you get. (laughs) (laughs) I'm usually not wearing my glasses. I haven't washed my hair in a couple of days. I'm wearing my husband's sweatshirt. Like, I'm not going to be wearing anything cute. You should not expect anything from me. (laughs) I mean, you came to my house. Like, who are you to ask me to have my hair brushed? (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of podcaster life, do you like that segue? (laughs) I like it. It's good. You do run a podcast and a literature podcast even. (laughs) Which you have been on and were gracious enough to introduce me to Terry Pratchett, for which I thank you immensely. (laughs) It was our pleasure. We had a blast. That was not a lead in to compliment us, but I like that you took (laughs) it No, but I took it. (laughs) I was wondering if producing and running a literature podcast has informed like the writing process at all for you. Mostly that I'm tired. But like, because <laughs> like, you know that how much work podcasts take, like they're a phenomenal amount of work, even if they're not like a full-time job level of like making money off of ads and stuff like that. Even if you just do it casually, like it's a, it's a lot, a lot of work. You have to read a lot. <laughs> they're a full-time job in the terms of the work that you're doing, just not in the terms of money that you get out of it. <laughs> exactly. It's like enjoyment higher on the podcast than work for me usually too, but still negligible difference sometimes, but like I had to stop reading mysteries while I was writing the book, which is like my favorite genre. You know, it's like, obviously I love it. So I'm writing one, but I had to stop reading them because I was like, first I get jealous because I'm one of the most jealous, like angry people in the world. And so I was like, crap, that's so good. It's so good. I hate you, Dashiell Hammett. That is just so good. And it's like, he's been dead for 40 or 50 years. I'm like, calm down. Or like, I was really scared that I was going to plagiarize people and put it in there. And so like, I had to do like a whole, whole kibosh on FBOL of like, no mystery novels, please no mystery novels. Like I can't do it. And uh, it stuck until October, (laughs) which was pretty good. (laughs) Was that just for the podcast or for your personal reading too? I mean, obviously you said that you had been reading Dashiell Hammett, but Yeah, by and large, personal reading took a hard, like, no mysteries, too. So I have, like, every one of my favorite mystery series released a new book this year, and I haven't read any of them because, like, just got to put on a hold. I don't want to snitch anything from, like, Richard Osmond's Thursday Murder Club. Like, that would be horrible. He could sue me. Dashiell Hammett can't, but Richard Osmond can. (laughs) (laughs) That's dedication. I can't even imagine stopping yourself from reading a book. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm a little cranky about it, but you know, <laughs> December, December is when all the guns start going again. <laughs> uh, so we've been kind of dancing around any like content questions because this is a mystery novel, but we have a couple of more fun sort of higher level ones that don't get into any spoilers. Not yet. Okay. N- n- yes, uh, not yet. Yeah, I'm I'm priming the audience and explaining why we're asking you fluff. <laughs> <laughs> so We get to meet several incredible characters in this book. Many, several, whatever multiple word you'd like me to use. Lots. (laughs) Plethora. Noun. Yes. Yes. Are there any that you wished had gotten more page time? Oh, that's a really good question. I love all of the like nameless working class people that they run into. Like I tried really hard to make Manhattan in 1950 to be as like ethnically diverse as she would run into. Obviously by the name, she's Italian. So is her boss, Tommy Fortuna. So they are running into Italians from all different places, Greek people, uh, the Ukrainian landlady is out there. And there's a bunch of different like unnamed people, like the elevator operators in one of the buildings. I was like, man, I really wish the elevator scene had taken a little (laughs) longer because those elevator operators are just like the just sweet old men. And I just wish I could have hung out with them a little bit more. 
I'm trying to think, I know I had to cut a couple scenes because they just didn't like fit with an edit that I had to do. And I'm pretty sure they were mostly with like taxi drivers, the nurses, oh, the nurse, the little like mean little nurse that takes care of her in the hospital. (laughs) I loved writing her. I wish I could have had her stay in the hospital for one more night. (laughs) Uh, well, Viviana probably appreciates that. Yeah. Uh, that had to change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you have a big elaborate backstory for Mrs. K, the the landlady, the Ukrainian landlady? You know, the Ukrainian landlady has kind of a sad background, and I feel really bad like bringing the party down on this one. But like, I was thinking about how old she was and um, also a lot of her habits. And so like, like most people, you know, from Eastern Europe, she's one of those people who really likes to feed you. And I have to tell you, like my grandmother is Polish, like my entire side of the family is super (laughs) Polish. So similar, but different. And so like, I was like, what is the reason why Mrs. K always is just kind of like, I have the solution to this problem. It's dinner. And so like, (laughs) I was doing a lot of research on what she might have lived through in old country before she came over to the United States. And I learned all about the great Ukrainian famine that was inflicted on the Ukrainian people by Russia back when they were in a previous war. It has a Ukrainian name that I cannot pronounce. I will text it to you so you can link to it or something like that. It's like Holodomor or something like that. I'm sure I'm butchering it. But like millions of people were starved to death during this great famine that was inflicted upon them. It reminded me of just how many cultures here of new immigrants came from what I call famine cultures of like, you know, it's like Italian grandmas feed you because like when they came over in the early 1900s, they were fleeing a famine, Greek people fleeing a famine, you know, a lot of people, especially throughout the 1900s, they were coming to the United States because there was literally nothing to eat in their country. And so I was like, ah, all of this informs like how they interact with each other, how they interact with food, what they connect over, things like that. And I was just like, this is the like, so sad. And I don't ever say it like explicitly in the book, but that's, that's her backstory is just, she escaped it with her husband and came to the United States and had a boy and it kept going from there. Well, good for her. Yeah, exactly. Mrs. K is a really great character. Like every single book, she like gets a little bit cooler and you're just kind of like, you're a great grandma. Like, this is (laughs) awesome. This is so neat. Like, (laughs) Yeah, I I loved Mrs. K. I mean, she just she had so much character and I loved how she kept trying to feed everyone and I wanted to eat her food. I was like, "Yes, please, please jump out of the page and feed me." <laughs> it's like chicken a la king and tuna noodle casserole and you're just like, "I haven't had those things since the late 80s. I totally want to <laughs> eat them now." <laughs> We talked about 50s nostalgia and how that was maybe not so much a factor for you, and that made me wonder about place as well because I know Ooh. like you mentioned you used to live in LA I have no idea what your relationship is with New York City obviously today is different from the 50s but <laughs> very much so <laughs> I am currently living and grew up in uh southeastern Connecticut so about an hour's drive outside of New York City and I always kind of joke that all of my family members came over to Ellis Island and got as far as Midtown and that's about as far <laughs> as they went So like all of all, all of my family basically was just like showed up here one day in the early 1900s and then never left New York City until my parents in the typical Republican 1980 sense went like, we can't raise kids in New York City. Let's move to the suburbs. And then we moved to the suburbs in the 1980s. So I was actually born there. I lived my first two years in Queens. And then uh, my parents shipped on up to the little white Connecticut suburbs for better or for worse. So I have always been like, oh, when I am an adult, I will move to the city and the city only meant New York city and I will live in the city. And that was the only thing I ever had on my mind. And then I moved to Los Angeles, which is the polar opposite of the city and lived there for 15 years. 
<laughs> so yeah, I love New York City. I remember when New York City was still kind of scrungy. And that's like, you know, you always have the hardened people like, I remember when New York City was dirty. And I was like, yeah, it wasn't that great, guys. Like buildings used to fall down for no reason. Like it was not awesome at all. And I'm not saying now is good, but I'm also just not saying that was better. And so like, I remember like the trailing little whispers of the New York City that I'm showing in this book of just like the last dying bleats of it before, you know, really Rudy Giuliani came out and just snuffed it out. And <laughs> now we're here. <laughs> I think the only thing that I want to talk about for Viviana before we can get into the spoiler section and actually talk about her is the fact that this book focuses on a secretary of a private investigator. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that choice of centering this book around a secretary instead of the private investigator. Who wants to hear another book about a dude? (laughs) (laughs) For some reason, I suspected that was the answer. (laughs) I mean, that's number one. It's just like, I'm not going to write a book about a dude. Like, you've met me. I'm not going to write a book about a dude. But it blows my mind. Like, prior to this year, probably, when you had the who needs feminism still, like, conversations Mm -hmm. with people. But, like, what would happen is most people didn't know that jobs used to be gendered. And that like, you literally couldn't, you would go to like jobs for women in the newspaper columns and it would be like secretary, nurse, teacher, that's it really. Or like factory worker. And that was about it. I was like, she can't be a private investigator yet. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's really a dicey proposition for her. And like, while there's nothing standing in her way legally, there's plenty of things standing in her way socially of becoming a private investigator or any other professional job where like, isn't just like nurse, teacher, secretary, factory worker. And so I was like, She has to start there. There's no other place for her to go. And for her backstory, you know, like this is a nice gig for her. She is from like destitute middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. And she's just kind of like, I can't do any better. This is great. Like there's a bathroom in the hall and my, my boss doesn't like sexually harass me. Like what could be better than this? And it's just like, you're right, hon. There's not much better for you right now. I really enjoyed the little bits of commentary that you you gave through kind of Mrs. K side-eyeing her for being a secretary to a private investigator. Yeah. Because like, even though, yeah, I mean, it's secretary, she still gets a little bit of that, like, well, you shouldn't, this isn't appropriate work for you to be doing as a woman. Yeah. Like class plays so much of a role into this of just like, you know, Mrs. K's got two very respectable girls under her roof and two not very respectable girls under her roof. And though they're all, you know, great and whatever, she judges them, but she's not going to kick them out because she wants the rent. And she just wishes that the other two girls were teachers and nurses. And But unfortunately, that's not what landed in her lap. So she'll take it as long as they can pay the rent. And I feel like that is like a pretty standard American way of interacting with people of just like, you are going to be defined by your job. And Viviana has got a kind of a scuzzy job and they're like, it's fine. Cause it's mostly during daylight hours. And like, we've met the man you work for, but if you wanted to become a teacher, we wouldn't tell you no. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah, everybody's had those jobs. <laughs> Well, that leads into my next question that I can't ask. So before we transition into our spoiler conversation, Sarah, why should you read this book? You should read this book if you want a really well-researched novel that takes place in the 50s that has like all of the ambiance of that, but like the gritty kind of ambiance, not necessarily the like whitewashed, (laughs) whitewashed. Yeah, not the whitewashed kind of ambiance and some really incredible cast of characters and a fantastic mystery. Like if you want a good mystery story with a great heroine, you should read this book. To avoid spoilers, skip to 5535. This next question might not technically be a spoiler, but I wanted to let you have room to give a spoilery answer. (laughs) How did you balance our modern sensibilities with historical accuracy when you were diving into issues like queer representation? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
the book is all white. I will point that out. And it is for obvious reasons of Black people were not allowed in most places where these characters are going. New York City was the last bastion of hardcore like Jim Crow segregation up north. They were holding on to that with a dying breath. And so like, I knew the book was going to be mostly white. Like it's as diverse as I can get it with white people. And it gets more diverse as the books go on just as a head. But like this book is all white. And I was like, I need some folk who aren't just like, gee, golly, Mr. You know, Mr. Wilson, like this needs to be. So I wanted to play with queer representation quite a bit because it's also just the politics of that time and now. And so I have a very strong mantra when it comes to writing historical fiction, because that's what this is. It's just those were the times is not an excuse that you're allowed to use. Yes, people were were bigots, are bigots, are terrible bigots. It's, It's just part of it. But like, The people who are living in those times, the characters that I'm writing, there's always good people in those times too. And so the people that I'm writing are allowed to be the good people of those times. And that's just kind of what I hold on to. It's like, they're going to run into jerks. They're going to run into idiots. But like my main characters are allowed to be the good people. Is it being too fluffy? I'm sure I'll get accused of it, but like, I'm okay with it. They're allowed to be the good people. And so that's kind of just how I approached it. (laughs) Oh, and sometimes it's just nice to read a book where the main character is a good guy. Not everything has to be grim. <laughs> <Yeah>. dark. <laughs> it's not a lot of moral conflict in that one, that particular yeah. instance. And I was going to say, it's not like you sugarcoat things. It's just you have good people in your books that are the main focus. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of conversations where Viviana has where she like really shows her butt about things where she's just kind of like. But, you know, that's not something you would get, you know, like called out for. And one of her friends is just kind of like, yeah, not you, but other people. And, you know, (laughs) she's allowed to be a hillbilly. She's allowed to like learn things along the way. But when someone corrects her, I've tried to make Viviana be some one of those people who's just like, oh, I was a jerk. Now I know this thing and I will proceed, you know, accordingly, which is, I think is like, kind of the best thing that you can do when someone, you know, tells you you're being a jerk. And like, I've done it a million times in my life. I'm from Connecticut. So like, (laughs) I've had to learn stupid lessons or I say stupid things. And someone just goes like, no, 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 you don't do that. And I go, okie dokie, you were correct. And so I was like, why can't Viviana be the exact same way? Absolutely. (laughs) It's also, I really love how, I mean, we talked about queer representation But a lot of that comes much later in the book because we have to get to know the characters better because basically everyone's in the closet, uh, which seems pretty accurate to me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And it sucks. Yeah. But it it sucks. But what can you do? It happened. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was doing a lot of research on like queer rights during the time. And like most people think of queer revolution happening in the 1970s. And of course, that is like, you know, when it really starts, you know, getting mainstream media focus. But there was still so much in the 1950s and it was still so underground. And it's, it is desperately heartbreaking to read about the histories of these people who are fighting for their rights just to, you know, exist and be allowed to wear whatever they wanted to. You know, there's there's significant hints to the reveal at the end if you know fashion history. And so that's something that actually like comes out quite a bit of just like It was illegal for women to wear blue jeans because they were considered men's clothing. And if you were caught outside wearing blue jeans, you could get a fine or tossed in the slammer for the night. And so it was considered like a queer thing to do. And so like, I think a lot of people nowadays really can't grasp just how strict gender definitions were by legal standards in the 1940s and 1950s. This isn't just social standards of people like going like, they're going to look down their nose at you because, you know, you don't seem air quotes normal, like you're supposed to be. This is like in the law, 
rules about how you can walk down the street. And I don't think a lot of people know that in the same way that a lot of people don't know that like jobs were classified by gender or like women couldn't have credit cards until the 1980s and just horrible stuff like that. So I tried to put as many kind of like breadcrumbs to that in as I could without being like very, very, very explicit and like giving the whole shebang a bang away. (laughs) Oh, that's fascinating. So that scene where that character is wearing Mm -hmm. jeans is the equivalent of her wearing a flannel and driving a Subaru. (laughs) Yeah, basically. Like, yeah, it's it's like her going, do you want to come with me to Lilith Fair? Like it is just like straight up her admitting who she is in front of a whole party of people. And like almost everybody is blind to it. And so, you know, she's being very brave, but, you know, because of the society that she interacts with, they have no idea. They don't like her because they know she's, you know, weird and she's like a rebellious person, but like she's being out without saying the words in a way that like more people would have known of than I give them credit for in the book. (laughs) Or maybe they were just being quiet to be polite and not cause yeah. trouble for her. I yeah. I mean, she's the most powerful person in the book. So like <laughs> they might've just been, you know, biting their tongues. And I am excited that we will presumably see more of her in books two and three, given that she gets a job as a <laughs> secretary. <laughs> she's a boot and a half in book two. Book three has more queer representation too, which I'm I'm really excited. And it's really fun to write because they're way more out and it's just like an absolute blast to not have to, you know, tiptoe around it and make it much more explicit and give characters like a safe space to be basically, usually in Mrs. K's. <laughs> <laughs> Viviana gets lots of flirting. Does Tally get some flirting, some flirts in later books? Uh, Not as much as I probably, she's slightly removed in book two. Like there's kind of a big hiccup there, which I don't really want to give away because it's really fun. Yeah. (laughs) But um, no, she, uh, she has a whole fun life ahead of her is what I will say. And uh, hopefully if I do get more than three books, she's going to get a whole friggin' novel by book four, I think. (laughs) Well, I can't wait for that. (laughs) Someone whose romantic interests we do get to see are our leading lady, Viviana. You don't have to tell me who, but do you hope that there's a fan favorite romantic interest? I do. And it takes a decidedly romantic turn in book two. And so she she has a fiance by the end of book two. And so oh do you, goodness. yeah. And so I'm not giving that away, but like, yeah, I no. love writing her flirt. Oh, I love writing her flirt. Cause she is just like, she's a shameless flirt. She's <laughs> so happy to just hit on anybody, even though like she, she's like a very plain looking woman. Like she's just, she's not a knockout. She's just kind of like a dame. And so I love that fact that she's just kind of like, I know I'm just going to flirt shamelessly with this guy and see where it takes me. And most of the time, everybody's pretty receptive to it. And she's just has absolutely no like F's to give about. doing it. And it's just really fun because like, again, like you can't be as sexual as like a lot of flirtation in like romance novel or like modern romance novels are. And so it has to be like 1950s flirting. And I'm just kind of like Bogey and Bacall movies, just bring it on. I'm going to have <laughs> so much fun with this. Uh, well, you answered my question if you had an end game in mind, although I, I guess do. being engaged doesn't make it an end game. So maybe I should uh, watch, mm-hmm. watch my assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to send you book two. I think you're going to love it. Oh, Oh, I'm excited. I'm such a sucker for romance. So I kind of felt like this book was a cock tease, but. Oh yeah, it totally is. I forgive you. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this is the spoiler section and she is just like, she loves Tommy so much. And so like one of my favorite series of all time is the movie series of the thin man. And so I was just like, it's a Nick and Nora dynamic where they just have like endless respect for one another. And like she and Tommy, like, let's be honest with you. Like (laughs) they're getting together. The tension of a romance or even just a like big old crush on someone who's not even on page for 99.9% of the book. I was just dying the whole time. 
<laughs> he's so handsome. Like the entire time I was writing it, I was like, I was envisioning like Chris Pine, like levels mm-hmm. of just like swarthy and like can get punched in the face real good, but like comes back and still looks charming. And you're just like, how, how are you that beautiful? And so like, I just imagined him the entire time while I was writing it. And I was just like, yeah, of course she's going to fall in love with him. He's just so <laughs> handsome. <laughs> I refer to it as uh, the Aragorn effect, which is where guys look hotter when they're a little beat up. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds like Tommy might have a little bit of that going on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He gets clocked pretty much all the time. And so he's just always like, she stitches him up, you know, like she's always just like, I have a steak hanging out the window in the winter time. So it's always cold and I can put it on your stupid face. Cause you just, why are you always getting hit? And he's just kind of like, it's my job. (laughs) I am very hopeful to see more of their dynamic on the page in the future and not just Viviana. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say lusting, but that's not quite right. That's not exactly what happens. No. Cause she's not tied down, you know, yeah. she's got her flirt on with the, with the beat officer the entire time. And you're just kind of like, he's too young for you, but is he? <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the hell out of that. I have to say I was rooting for him until he stole her hairpin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this can't be where we're going then. <laughs> I really liked the tension where Viviana's like, madly in love with her boss with Tommy but like he's not there like he hasn't actually sent word to her so she's you know she's going out with this nice side piece who is interested in her but then yeah he stole her hair piece and I was like "Uh uh-uh you're not Mm -hmm. you're not worthy of our girl (laughs) well even though she's in love with Tommy they're not together so she can do whatever (laughs) she wants he's never said anything and so (laughs) she's just kind of like fine free to roam and he's Mm -hmm. like fine free to roam and yeah, they're free to roam until they're not anymore. <laughs> but every time she finds a book in his office and she's like, what kind of girls is he bringing here? I was like, oh, I, you sound a little invested in that question, honey. Exactly. <laughs> she's like, what kind of dames are bringing pulp novels to my boss's office? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you're jealous, but you won't say a damn thing. <laughs> So out of curiosity, how much do you plan when you're writing? I mean, this is a mystery novel, so presumably there had to be some planning involved. (laughs) There's some, uh, surprisingly less than uh, most people would like to hear. For this one, I did not plot at all. I just wung it. And I was like, let's see what happens. And I knew the big reveal. Like I knew that someone was going to be, you know, kind of outed in a way that I was trying not to be icky about it, but it's still a little icky and I'm I'm sorry. Uh, No better now than to do that. But uh, that I knew someone was going to be outed in this. Initially, the reason why I was called Viviana Valentine gets her man is that I also wanted Viviana to be gay. And then I was like, I'm not. So I probably shouldn't write a gay main character because I wanted her to end up with the girl who uh, who was outed at the end of the book. But I was like, no, that's that's too much. That's you're not going to do that well. So I declined and, and did this instead, which I'm much happier with. Book two, I knew the basic gist of what I wanted to have happen. Again, kind of like this, where I was like, I knew who the bad guy was and I knew kind of where I was going to go with it. And uh, I really enjoyed writing that. Do not suggest writing a book while you're moving across the country. Very bad news. (laughs) Don't do it. You will lose all your hair. The third one, I plotted everything. I was like sticky notes for different (laughs) subplots and it's been the hardest journey yet and I hate it. So I'm literally (laughs) just yesterday, I was like, forget this. I threw all my notes away and I was just like, just finish the damn book. (laughs) So I don't plot. The moral of the story is, is my brain does not work like that. I just have to just pants it the entire time. I love that. I love that so much. Well, in that case then, was there anything that really surprised you when you wrote it? Like when you got there, a scene or a character or anything? Not really, surprisingly. Like I, it took me, God, I wrote Viviana Valentine, like the first couple drafts of it, like five years before, like now. So I've been working on this and rewriting it and pitching it and rewriting it and like living in, in Viviana Valentine for half a decade. And so that's just, you know, publishing takes forever. And a lot of people get to put their input into it and usually it's good. So like nothing really surprised me by the end of it in book two, I get surprised a little bit more, but I ruminate a lot. 
So, you know, there's a lot of like, I'm going to go take a three hour shower and think about some stuff and steam. And my husband's just kind of like, cool, we pay for water. Don't do that. <laughs> and so like, I, I ruminate a lot. So I, I haven't gotten as surprised as I probably should have. <laughs> Mm, there's actually this very cool invention called bathtubs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. well, I was going to say it's probably easier to take a three hour shower now that you're not in California. Exactly. That too. Exactly. Yeah. No, wait, I live where it rains now, so yeah. it's much better. <laughs> but you, you mentioned that you had a different ultimate romantic love interest for Viviana and that changed. But besides that, like how different is the published book of Viviana Valentine gets her man from the first draft. I'm trying to think it is mostly the story that I started out telling. Like I, I kiboshed making Viviana queer like myself pretty early on. Cause I was like, I'm not going to do that justice. I'm just going to be a jerk about it. Let queer people tell their own stories. Not for me. And so I nipped that one real fast, but first draft, she ended up with the girl and, you know, and arrested someone. So I wanted it to be kind of like, she gets her man of arresting someone, but you know, ends up with the girl. Ha ha ha. But then I was like, no, you're an idiot. But (laughs) after that, I want to say that like, not too much got changed. I don't think like my editor was really good about being like, Hey, you described this 1500 times. Guess what? Don't do that. And, you know, it was more just like cleaning up sloppy stuff than changing the overall plots and plot beats and stuff like that. So pat on the back. me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you left me guessing until the last reveal. <laughs> oh, good. Like, good, good guessing or bad guessing. Good guessing. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I had a couple of ideas. I was not like, oh, I know what happened. Yeah. (laughs) Presumably, although this book is not out at the time of this recording, it's been read by people. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There's Goodreads reviews and stuff like that. Has anyone claimed to have gotten the mystery? No, which I'm not sure is a good thing. What makes me feel better? (laughs) I'm starting to wonder if I made it too convoluted or like too like slapdash off the wall. So I'm trying to like play it a little bit better plot in the second and third one. So it's not just like someone on Twitter referred to like those end scenes where everybody gathers as like the accusatorium scenes where it's just like, you know, like, oh, Thin Man movie is like the, oh, the Thin Man book is like the perfect example of this, where it's just like, it makes no flipping sense whatsoever. And then all of a sudden you find out like Macaulay's the murderer and you're just kind of like that that came out of nowhere. So I was kind of hoping that I, someone would be like, oh, of course I saw it a million years ago, but like so far, not yet. And that actually makes me a little nervous. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't get all of it. Like I, I was guessing for a lot of it, but you do have that hint about the three reporters that Viviana talks to. Yeah. yeah. And like, I was like, okay, I bet that that specifically is her father. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that, I'm glad that made sense. I was like the pencils, like the cedar thing, like the, the scents play like, oh my God, my copy editor was like, I have no idea who my copy editor was. They were just hired by my publishing firm. And like smell plays a really important role in this book. And every single time I mentioned a smell, he was like, why are you talking about what it smells like? And I was just like, dude, when you get to the end, you will figure it out. I'm sorry. She has to talk about what things smell like. Also because people have noses. Like, <laughs> that's not that weird. Also because people have noses. I'm sorry. If no one's mad about Geralt being obsessed with how Yennefer smells like lavender and gooseberries, then you can do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> There's one scene where like, I, I mentioned that like Tally's big apartment doesn't even smell like Windex or like cleaning mm-hmm. fluids. And he was like, why are you talking about this? And I was like, because have you ever been in a rich person's house? <laughs> like they don't have a scent. And it's fucking weird. Like, Mm -hmm. it's so weird. Like the people who clean it and the things they clean it with don't exist. It's so bizarre to be in rich people's houses. Like I have to mention that like it doesn't know what to do with the fact that our house doesn't have a stink. (laughs) I think that one of the fun things about it is that like now I can reread the book and be like, oh, here are the clues that I missed the first time. Like the sense, like, you know, I didn't put that together. But, you know, now that I know the reveal, I can be like, oh, that number two tattoo. I get it now. I know the importance. I'm so excited. (laughs) It gives it so much like reread value. Yeah. 
Sarah was giving me shit before recording that I listed Sandy amongst Viviana's love interests. Uh, yes, I was. <laughs> but he was, though. Because well, at the end, you know that obviously they could never have, like, you know she's not into him, but that doesn't make him, like, out of the running from the beginning. No, but, like, really early on, she talks about how she broke up with him because, like, he hit her or attempted to hit her. Like, she's not going to stay. She has too much self-respect to stay with a man like that. I mean, yeah, but that doesn't make him, like, not in that circle of people. Well, sure, he was a former love interest. I'm not arguing that. I'm just arguing that he's not a prospective love interest for her, like, in the series. Like, obviously, he's not Endgame because he's a douchebag. Yeah, (laughs) he's a terrible human. But I will say that, like, Viviana had to be talked into breaking up with him. Like, that is true. Like, Tommy had to be like, no, people aren't allowed to treat you that way. And I feel like that's still pretty common of just like, it's probably more, you know, emotional and verbal abuse now, but and gaslighting and stuff like that. But like, people need someone to tell them that you can't stay with an abuser, especially in 1950s. And especially if like, when you're from the sticks and you're poor as dirt, sometimes people need to tell you that your standard of treatment is is higher and she didn't know that's I mean that's that's true that's a very fair point I'm also a trash person who loves reading about toxic relationships so (laughs) I was never like oh they'd be really good together I was like but what if they got back together that would be awful tell me more He's a real piece of work. And yeah, no, like I come from a family of like lots of abusive people for, you know, and it's just, you sometimes have to be told that like, you're not allowed to treat people that way, or you deserve better treatment than that. And I wanted to make Viviana to have like complex feelings about it, where she was just like, Tommy had to sit me down and tell me. And that's how I know he cares about me because like, you know, it's a tough conversation to have with someone. And I really liked it because it shows, like, it does a really good job of showing their relationship, like you said. We also get to see her incredible support system with the other girls in Mrs. K's house. Because the way Sandy is first introduced, I think Phyllis or Betty asks Viv to go get something from inside the house to give Viv an excuse to run inside which sure would have been nice if she could have just gone inside, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but the girls banding around her like just felt really good, yeah, and is so important for people in that kind of situation. Yeah, I didn't want to have her living in an apartment building. Not only was it not entirely realistic for the time, because like apartments, who guys, apartments in New York City in the mid-century were freaking weird. And they're not even remotely of what you think of apartments today. So like you see people be like, oh, and you know, 1950 apartment in Greenwich Village was only $40 a month. And I was like, yeah, that's because you had to share a toilet with 90 other people in the building. And it was downstairs and outside. Like, it's not a good situation. But like, girls boarding houses were incredibly popular, you know, in the mid-century and in the post-war years. And I was like, she has to live with other people. Like, there's Mm -hmm. no way that she can just go from like living by herself or like with one roommate to like working for Tommy and then like back to herself. Like that's way too isolated. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give her a boarding house where she's been living for a really long time, you know, and she doesn't have a good relationship with her family back home. And she's just kind of like surrogate family, found family is something that was like really, really important for me to get into this. And the girls are so much fun, (laughs) so weird. And I adore them. (laughs) Does Phyllis come back? I know she runs off to Paris. She does run off to Paris. I I never get to see her again. I have made references Mm -hmm. to Viv like wanting to go to Paris, Mm -hmm. but I did not have plans for Phyllis to come back yet. Well, again, see how many books I get. (laughs) And that's probably good for Phyllis, right? I don't want to wish that she fails so that I can just see her in a book. That seems unfair. Exactly. (laughs) But she's cool. I was like, oh, no, I'll have Viv go to her. Like, (laughs) yeah, I like that better. (laughs) Yeah, I really enjoyed the support system that Viv had in all of those women. They were great. I loved them. They were pretty cool. I like Dottie a lot. Dottie is my freaking, (laughs) I am a Dottie, like through and through. I just love Dottie so much. (laughs) Was there anything we didn't cover that you'd like to talk about? I don't know. Like, it, it is a very complicated thing to write books about a time period that people kind of like 
see through rose colored glasses. Mm. And I, I, you know, I didn't want this to be like doom and gloom. Oh my God, everything was terrible, you know, but at the same time, like I had to be way more truthful than a lot of things that take place in the 1940s and 1950s are. And it was just a really eye-opening book to write as like all of our political stuff is happening too, where I'm just kind of like, wow, we have come nowhere. Absolutely (laughs) like very little zilchy progress compared to like what they had to deal with. And it's super depressing, but at the same time, I'm like, just write about dresses for five minutes and make yourself feel better. Oh my God, cry, you know, but it's really opened up my eyes significantly to like, just how politics works now, because like America pre-World War II was a very different country. And then America post-World War II, we are still so obviously living in. And it's just like, wow, we need we need the next era because this sucks. <laughs> well, we got a little glimpse of the counterculture in this novel. That's true. Which I do hope we get to spend a little more time in in the future, only because it was such a breath of fresh air. (laughs) (laughs) I will tell you that book two is all about the Red Scare. And so like it is full on Soviet propaganda. And it's just like, it's it again, super weird time to be writing this book about how awful Russia is. Um, (laughs) Oops. But the third book, the third book has a lot more counterculture in it that that has to do a lot more with like vice and like what happened to Times Square after World War II. And so there's like peep shows and and dancers and and all that. And like the vice squad kind of comes into play a little bit in book three. That's what I'm writing now. And it is a hoot. It is (laughs) like, again, not not great how the system was set up, but interesting things to learn. (laughs) Well, I can't wait to get my hands on it. One of my favorite parts of this book was all of the intense slang that we get from the first person narrator, but also the dialogue. And I was wondering if you had any favorite slang. First and foremost, I want to tell people who do not like the slang, I totally get it. It is like, <laughs> it's it's a lot of slang. The slang gets cut back a little bit in books two and three, but I was just so excited to use all these new words that like, <laughs> and it was just so much fun. But like, I have to admit, my parents talk like this. I have no idea why. My mother's <laughs> dress growing up was dollface. So she'd be like, hey, dollface, how you doing this morning? And it's like, mom, why are you talking like this? <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you talking like a 1930s gun mall? But like, that's how she did. And so like almost all of this was stuff that either my, my parents or grandparents would say. So I was like, uh, surely everybody knows what this means. And no, so <laughs> sorry to everyone who had to like look things up on the internet while reading this book. But like my favorite piece that I learned was again, that nasty little nurse where Viv is in the hospital and she looks at her and she goes, no man likes a chippy. And I was just like, <laughs> in context, you know, that chippy means like floozy or something like that, you know, or something equally as derogatory, but I'm like, That's so much fun. I didn't know that one before. (laughs) I think my favorite thing from the slang specifically in this book was how Viv never does anything. Her butt does things. (laughs) (laughs) But she also never uses the word butt. It's always like, oh, my butt will go here or my butt will sit or my butt will hurry or something like that. My keister up the town and stuff like that. I was just like, oh, Viv's talking about her butt again. All right. <laughs> She's like, I have my center of gravity is here. It is my personhood. It's my ass has got to do something around here. <laughs> like, I want to write an essay about like identifying with parts of yourself and like how fascinating that is, but then also refusing to use the common term for it at the same time. <laughs> a little embarrassed because I never realized that she did that. (laughs) (laughs) Lots of tushes and lots of keisters. Yeah. I think partially because she gets injured. I don't think that's a spoiler. No, it's not. At some point she gets injured. And so she's like, yeah, my butt's sore, which is very (laughs) fair. (laughs) She goes flying down the stairs. She's like, my ass hurts. What am I going to do? And I totally believe that she wouldn't actually say my ass hurts. So like, that was fine. It was just at that point I was like, all right hurry your sore ass somewhere. 
exactly. <laughs> now I'm totally embarrassed because I didn't realize I did that. <laughs> I, you didn't do that. Viv did. That's just who she is now. <laughs> That's true. I was reading this on an airplane and I was like, I really shouldn't just be like laughing at like my bad internal butt jokes <laughs> for an entire three hour flight. But I did. And everyone else around me had to deal with that. They're That's welcome. Awesome. <laughs> Sarah, did you have any favorite slang from the book? Not that I can think of specifically. Wrong answer. <laughs> I know. I know. It is the wrong answer. Maybe it's just that all of the slang was too good and I can't pick one <laughs> I will have to admit that like the phrase like sour puss or like had a sour puss on her face and stuff like that like really pissed off my copy editor he had no idea what to do with that and I was just mm. like I don't know what to tell you my grandmother said it all the time <laughs> like why do you got that sour puss on your face and it just means like why are you frowning why do you look like cranky about something and I was just like is this that weird of a phrase? Can you really not <laughs> just determine what that means? I don't know. Should I leave it? Should I get rid of it? I just left it because I was like, grandma, like Viv is partially based on my grandma. So like, <laughs> you know, like she sucks like a caraway seed out of her tooth in like the very beginning of the thing. I was like, oh, that was my grandmother, like through and through, like no class whatsoever. And I loved her to death. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I wasn't confused by any of the slang. Like, it fit. <laughs> yeah, no, it was all perfect. Like, some of it was jarring only because I was like, oh, yeah, we're, we're in the 1950s. <laughs> I, like, yeah. where you are in the moment at every point in this book. And the slang had a lot to do with that. Oh, that's good. That's exciting to hear. Thank you. Because I was, I was seriously nervous. I was like, should I really tone it back? Because like, it, it can kind of sound like a Bugs Bunny cartoon at a certain point. I just didn't want it to sound exactly like that. But I was like, but the words are so much fun and nobody <laughs> says them anymore. So I have to. <laughs> this isn't a slang thing, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. It's my podcast and I can. <laughs> There was one moment I did have to like stop and think, which is when I think Dottie puts on a felt turban. Yes. <laughs> and that like there was a record scratch in my head. And I was like, a what? And then I stopped a moment and I was like, oh no, I can actually absolutely picture exactly what that is in my head. I would just have not thought how I would describe that, but that's exactly what that is. Yeah. Like <laughs> one of those funny little hats. Like I see yeah. it. Yeah, like turbans are incredibly popular headwear throughout like the mid-century, like starting from the 20s and into the 60s, like women wore turbans. And like the only person I have ever seen wear a turban was this gorgeous trans woman who, who was like a, my waitress at a restaurant once before I left. And she was stunning. It was this emerald green turban. And she was just like, she worked it so well. And I was like, God, I wish I could pull that off. You look so stunning and she was just like I know and the <laughs> best and I was like you need to bring back the turban I was like you have to have a very specific face to pull them off or else you'd look like me where it's just like a pile of mashed potatoes and it's not gonna work but like oh uh, turbans we should wear hats we should bring back hats <laughs> That's my main takeaway from writing a 1950s book we need hats <laughs> I feel the same way about like hair scarves I yeah. have friends who wear them and I'm like, oh shit, that's really cute and seems like pretty practical. But I would, no, <laughs> that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. You talked a little bit about you were working on book three. I don't know if you have anything else you can tell us, if not totally understandable. Also, where can you be found on the internet for our listeners who have enjoyed this episode and want to go out and buy your book and follow you and listen to your podcast and all of that, which everyone should, obviously. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Like, it's so weird to plug more than one book. But yeah, like uh, Viviana Valentine Gets Her Man just came out yesterday. The next one is actually coming out in six, seven months. So it's May of 2023. It's called Viviana Valentine Goes Up the River. I've been having a lot of fun with gangsters slang trying to like name these things so she goes up the river to Westchester which is like the toniest neighborhood north of New York City and she participates in kind of a, like a locked mansion 
murder mystery. Ooh. And so it, it feels very Agatha Christie and it's really <laughs> fun. And so that I just finished edits on that. So that one is too bad. And that is definitely coming out in May. And then the third book is coming out, which you can't pre-order yet because it doesn't have a title. And that's coming out in November of 2023 too. So it's like been nonstop Viviana for as long as I can recall. And so, yeah, that three book series so far. That's a really short turnaround for all of those books. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, <laughs> next time when I fill out my contract of how long I want to write a book, I'm giving myself a year rather than six months because this is, it's not tenable. I will, I will tell you right now, I'm having fun. It's just not tenable. But um, if you want to watch me plow through writing the third book before it's due in December, you can um, follow me on my personal Twitter, which is Ms. Emily Edwards, or you can follow me on podcast Twitter, which is Fuck Boys of Lit, which is B-O-I-S. And uh, that's where you'll mostly find me lurking like a golem, like hoping to finish my work in time. <laughs> and if people want to listen to your podcast, it's I'm assuming it's available on all standard podcast platforms. Indeed it is. You can search for either FBOL because some platforms do not like curse words, or you can look up Fuck Boys of Lit as well. And you'll find the short versions of all of my episodes are for free on anywhere you stream. And if you want to listen to the full length ones for the last couple of years, you can head on over to Patreon where a buck will unlock basically all of them for the last couple of years as well. It's patreon.com slash fuckboys of lit. Do you have to mark all of your content as explicit? Because I do. fuck is in the title. Oh I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> iTunes was not happy with me for a very long time. <laughs> I mean we mark all of our episodes as explicit because I say fuck a lot. Yeah. <laughs> which I think is more earned than just <laughs> the great slang which is fuck boy yeah i mean i also curse like a sailor so like you know it totally makes sense but yeah for the longest time it wasn't even like searchable on itunes because it had the word fuck in the title no yeah that's bogus not the future on lists so i'm just kind of like clearly you're fine with it <laughs> <laughs> they're only fine with it if you're successful exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> Well, thank you again so much. This has been a blast and I can't wait to read book two. I'll send it to you soon. <laughs> yes, Yay. please. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We are on Twitter and Instagram at Fiction Fans Pod. You can also email us at fictionfanspod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye! Bye.